Well, open your Bibles tonight to the book of Joshua as we continue our study of the big picture of Scripture. Again, as our brother just prayed, continuing to trace the storyline and the history of redemption. We find ourselves coming into uh, the land in Joshua, and we'll begin to look at the time spent in the land. It runs from Joshua really to the end of 2 Kings. Let me just remind you of the introduction at the top of your page there. As we get into this uh, consideration of Israel as a people gathered, as the people of the Lord, Israel must learn that they can't keep the law in their own strength, having been given the law. And remember, as they said to Moses, all that the Lord has said, we will do. This is very simple, they think. They find it impossible, in fact. They need to learn that they can't keep the law in their own strength. They must receive God's forgiveness by faith, and they must receive God's covenant relationship as a gift of His free grace. They're not going to be able to earn it, merit it, make a return upon it. They are simply the beneficiaries in the Lord's providence. They are the beneficiaries and the recipients of the Abrahamic covenant. They're Abraham's descendants. That's all there is to it. At that point, in a a real um, candid way, that's what distinguishes them from the rest of the world. That's what distinguishes them in Egypt. They're Abraham's descendants. They are heirs to the covenant. Of course, that's all the Lord's doing. If they're to be God's people in God's place with God's presence, it'll only be by the free electing covenanting grace of Yahweh, the God of Abraham, which becomes so clear because remember when God goes into Egypt to get them, they're idolaters, they're grumblers, they're complainers. Though Abraham's descendants, they prove to be more and more Adam's descendants, sinners. Spoiler alert here, just to give us a heads up as to where we are in redemptive history, where we're going. The book of Joshua, of course, begins with the people of Israel entering the place where they will experience God's presence, right? As we know, they're coming into the land of Canaan. However, in Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and of course most of the prophetic books that overlap with that, Israel repeatedly sins which ultimately leads to their exile from the land at the close of 2 Kings, with the ten tribes going into Assyria, and the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, of course, as our brother mentioned from Psalm 137, going into Babylon. So that's where we are in the history, and again, the beautiful thing is this is where the prophets will begin to interlay as we come across with the kings after Elijah and Elisha. So let me read, let's read uh, Joshua 1, we'll look at verses 1 to 9, and just get the setting here. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given it to you, just as I promised to Moses." From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Moses gives his final sermon in Deuteronomy. The end of Deuteronomy, of course, by editorial comment, Moses dies and now they are ready to enter into the land. And they're going to come into the land under Joshua's leadership. But notice what we read. They're going to come into the land under Joshua's leadership in accordance with the Abrahamic covenant. It's the Abrahamic covenant that is being fulfilled. That's why God went through Moses into Egypt to get them. Exodus 2, Exodus 3, Exodus 5, and on through. Moses was sent to get the people out of Egypt, to lead them out of Egypt, because they're Abraham's descendants and God has come. He remembered his covenant, you remember. He saw, he heard, he 
and he remembered, he knew, and he's come to fulfill his promise. The, the time of the, the iniquity of the Amorites is fulfilled. Remember as he prophesied, the Lord said of that in Genesis 15. Once the iniquity of the Amorites is fulfilled, then of course Joshua, or, um, the people will come into the land and he will dispossess the Canaanites. Now, Joshua is going to lead them into the land, but you can see from what we just read, what's the condition for Joshua to lead them into the land? The condition set for Joshua is obedience. Be strong, courageous, right? Do, he says, keep all the commandments given to you, right? That, that uh, through Moses do not turn to the right or to the left. That's going to give you, look at the end of verse 7, that will give you good success wherever you go, right? And every, uh, he makes the promise, no man shall be able to stand before you. I will not leave you, forsake you. And then he reminds him of obedience. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, you shall meditate on this law. It shall not depart from your mouth. Be careful to do all that's written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous. You see how God is combining Joshua's obedience, his faithfulness, is what is, is the condition for them being brought into the land. The Lord, of course, will secure that by his own spirit. But you see the connection between Joshua's obedience and the Lord's fulfilling of the covenant. Now, obedience is expected of all of Israel. We read that last Lord's Day in Deuteronomy 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Walk in his ways, keep his commandments, love him, serve him, do not give up, give your way to the idols, but in fact, fear God and serve him only. But obedience is especially incumbent upon Joshua as the leader, just as it was upon Moses. Remember, Moses lost the land because of his disobedience. Not simply disobedience, but his disobedience before the people, right? When he was to obey the, when he was to obey the Lord before the people, he did not, and therefore he was not able to enter the land. So Joshua has that same obligation as the leader. And Joshua is to meditate on the law of God, and he's to join courage and obedience to his faith in God, right? His confidence in the entering in the land, and this becomes clear in Joshua 5 when the Lord of hosts appears to him. Joshua's confidence in entering into the land and dispossessing the Canaanites and taking possession of the land, his confidence is not upon his obedience. His obedience will not secure it. His confidence is not upon his courage. His courage will not secure it. The Lord will secure it. Joshua had said as much 40 years ago. The Lord is with us. They will be bread, bread unto us, right? The Lord is with us. The Lord will go with us. With the Lord, we shall be able to conquer and take possession of the land. Joshua's courage and confidence is in the Lord because his faith is in the Lord. His faith is in God and his covenant. And the difference, the encouragement given then to Joshua as the leader repeatedly through those nine verses is what? God's presence is with him. I am with you. That's why you're not to be discouraged. That's why you're not to be afraid. That's why you're not to fear or even turn to the right or to the left. Because I am with you. No one will stand before you. Just as I was with Moses, which was so visibly, tangibly clear, bringing the whole people out of Egypt and all of the plagues and then the, the, the mighty victories and miracles in the wilderness, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. So Joshua's courage and obedience is fueled by his faith in God and particularly notice in God's presence. That's really, if, we, if there's a takeaway for tonight, it's God's presence. God's presence is what makes or breaks it. God's presence changes everything. So the obedience of the leader was established as necessary and important for the people in Deuteronomy. In, in Moses' last message, turn to Deuteronomy 17. And here, even under Moses, it's interesting, God gives instructions for a king. This helps us to appreciate that when Samuel gets so upset that they ask for a king, and then, of course, ultimately at that point it's Saul that is appointed, Samuel is angry because they ask for a king because it's a rejection of God as king. The problem isn't that they wanted a king. In fact, God had instilled into the whole plan that there would be a king. That's one of the things that we'll take away tonight as well, this human representative that there is to be a king that will rule over God's people. He will be God's arm, if you will, over the people. So God had already provided for a king. The problem wasn't that Israel wanted a king. You remember it was whether they wanted a king like the nations. That kind of a king. A victorious king. So head and shoulders above them all, they chose Saul, right? The son of Kish. They wanted a king like the, like the nation's king. A military king. A victorious king. A triumphant king. 
God's king is to be a godly king, right? A faithful king. So look here at Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it, read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. Sounds just like what, that's the same wording he gave to Joshua, isn't it? That his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Notice there's no great military exploits. In fact, no horses, <laughs> no chariots, right? There's no great military exploits. It's not that kind of a king that the Lord has in store for his people. It's a king that will lead in godliness. It's a king that will lead in holiness. A king that will be a, a man given, uh, his heart and mind and soul given to the book, the, the book of the law, the word of God. And Joshua, these, the very same words and ideas are brought up in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua is being identified as that kind of a leader. That kind of a godly man who will fear the Lord, walk in the ways of the Lord, take courage in the presence of the Lord, and he will lead God's people into the land. So the king then is to be one who walks in the ways of God's law. And this is because the king, or the leader of Israel, represents the people and his personal holiness affects the life of the nation. You remember it was the king of Israel who was called the son of God. Right? The king had that nomenclature. He was the son of God. And he was to stand as representative of the people and his holiness would affect or his relationship to God would affect the nation. So look at letter C. This is important. There's several lessons I want to draw out tonight and highlight here. This is one of them. This is important to understand because what this reveals as we have Joshua set up as, as this leader and then, of course, it's Joshua is giving way to the king who will come after him. Of course, we have the period of judges, which is a failure because of the problem of sin and needing a king to be appointed. But what we see then is it reveals that God's rule over God's people in God's place, right, is mediated through a human ruler. A human ruler. Again, God had already made provision through Moses' words. God had already made provision for a king. In fact, the Lord prophesied that Sarai... Right, would give birth to a king. A king would come from her line, right? The seed of Abraham would be kingly. And of course, you think of the, even the blessing of Jacob over his sons, that there would be a king, a royal scepter in the tribe of Judah, of course. So the rule of God over the people of God in the place of God was to be mediated through a, hum, a human ruler who would be mighty and victorious. No, one who would in particular reflect the character of God. Again, as the Son of God, he would reflect the character of God to his people, that holiness, that wisdom. Some of what we saw in David, some of what we saw in Solomon, and yet both men falling short, all of which we only see ultimately in Christ. So this theme is important for understanding the kingdom of God that we've been studying, and it explains then why the history of Israel recounted in the Old Testament um, is not only by the recording, the rise and rule of the various kings, that he reigned for so and so many years and then he died, but the history of Israel is recounted in the Old Testament by recording what kind of king he was in relation to Yahweh, particularly in relation to God and the covenant, the law of God. So what was his relationship to God's laws and God's ways? Every reign of every king is determined and characterized by the king's relationship to the law of God. Did he walk in the ways of the Lord? And then, of course, it becomes, did he walk in the ways of his father, David? Or did he not? Did he instead walk in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? Right? Did he walk in the ways of David? Did he walk in the ways of the Lord? Was his heart true to the Lord? Right? This is the reflection. 
And that description of the king gives you an immediate indication of his reign and the experience of the people. Because as went the king, so went the nation. Because it was the king, like Solomon before them, who started it. It was the king who set up high places. It was the king who made idols. It was the king who had an altar built in the house of the Lord, an idolatrous altar. The king sets the, sets the state for the people. What kind of king is he? It directly impacts the nation because of the important role that he played. So you can see again, come back now, this is why Joshua is being directed the way that he is. Right? Be a man of faith, be a man of the book, be a man of courage, because I am with you. Right? And I will use you to lead my people. You shall bring them into the land, and every place upon which their foot is trod, I will give it to them. So despite the failure of all of Israel's kings, the point of the obligation upon them is to foreshadow the fact that the promises of God are to be fulfilled by a human kingly figure. Why, why this, con this continual uh, assessment of the kings and their relationship to the law of God? It's a foreshadow of the fact that one day a king is coming. Nope, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one. One day, a king is coming who will be obedient to the law of God, who will be the true son of God, and who will rule the people in righteousness with a royal scepter, and whose throne, the foundation of which will be righteousness and justice. That king is coming. And so you have Israel constantly looking for this king. God saying, such a king is the kind of king that is, to be ne that is needed. Such a king is in store for the people of God, but it's not going to be in any of these kings, not even in David, not even in Solomon, certainly in none of their sons, but one is coming, one who will be worthy to lead God's people into the promised land, which is not Canaan, but heaven, right? The land of heaven, and that can be none other than Jesus Christ. Let's go trace some of these verses here in Joshua, excuse me, Deuteronomy 18, and remember what Joshua, uh, Moses said about the one who is to come after him. One who is appointed, one whom the Lord will give and provide, who will lead the people. Deuteronomy 18, a new prophet like Moses, beginning in verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Now remember what we just read in chapter 17, right? One from among your brothers, verse 15, you shall set as king over you. Not a foreigner who is not your brother. So one from among you, one who is your brother. That's the kind of man who will be chosen to be king. Now look at the language in the very next chapter. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. Same reference point, right? This will be a king. He'll also be a prophet, and the Lord will appoint him. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So there's one in store, right? Chapter 17, you're going to have a king one day, and he's going to be a righteous man. Chapter 18, you're going to have a prophet one day. And he's going to have in his very mouth the words of God. To him you shall listen. And if you don't, the Lord will require it of you. You will perish because he bears the word of God to you. So this kingly figure will be a prophetic figure and, of course, a priestly figure as well. So we've read Joshua. Now go to the Psalms. Look at Psalm 1. Again, what I'm pointing out here is why, the, why there's an obligation, such a strict obligation of holiness that rests upon Israel's leaders, Israel's kings, right? Because they are to be types and foreshadows of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the true king, the righteous king, the holy king, right? And so you look at Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Who is this man? Ultimately, it's Christ. But notice the language, just like what the Lord said to Joshua. Don't turn to the right or to the left. 
right? Walking in the ways of sinners and scoffers. But delight in the law of God, meditate on the law of God. That's the kind of man that is blessed and the kind of man who is worthy to lead God's people. Psalm 2, of course, we sang this morning, Why do the nations rage? The people plot in vain. He who sits in the heavens laughs. I, as for me, I have set my king, right, on Zion, my holy hill. Many scholars have suggested for many, many years that Psalm 1 and 2 are originally one psalm, right? So you can see the connection between that blessed man, right? Blessed is that man. He is that king. Then, of course, the end of Psalm 2, blessed are all those who take refuge in him because he's the son of God. He is the king of God. And therefore, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling before his wrath is stirred. Turn to Psalm 24. Again, we're looking for someone who can stand before the Lord, someone who is a worthy leader. Joshua, excuse me, Psalm 24, verses 3 to 6, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Who is this blessed man that can dwell in the presence of God? A holy man, a righteous man. See, this is true greatness before God, not military conquest. Holiness, righteousness, all stemming from and flowing out of faith, all right? Faith in God and in his gospel on our part and righteousness on the part of Christ. Turn, of course, to Psalm 45. We have this psalm of the blessed one, right? This most handsome of the sons of men. Verse 1, my heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty ride out victoriously for the cause of what? Truth and meekness and righteousness. You see what motivates this king? Your throne, O God. And this is quoted in Hebrews 1 in reference to Christ and none other than Christ. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. What is mighty about the king that the Lord chooses? His uprightness, his, righteous, his righteousness, truth, justice, holiness. You have loved righteousness. You have hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. It's easy and light. And then, of course, finally turn to Hebrews 4 and see... New Testament, reflecting back, and not only reflecting back upon the Old Testament, but reflecting back on Joshua, right? Hebrews 4 reflects back, not on Joshua even at the beginning in chapter 1, but Joshua at the end, after they've been brought into the land. Joshua's already conquered the land. And now, what does it say in, Josh, in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 8? For if Joshua had given them rest... God would not have spoken of another day later on, right, in the Psalms. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall short of the same sort, by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then, he goes on, since then we have a great high priest. Wait a minute, we were talking about this one who would give us rest, right? Which we know is, would be one like Joshua, a military leader. And yet the only one who can give rest is the righteous one, a holy one, a man of God who can be king. And now in the, in the very next language, this very same one is a priest. See how they're all brought together. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may find, we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
Hebrews reflects and says, if, if, if Joshua had really brought them into the rest right, that God had in store and that God was prophesying and that the covenant envisions true, full rest, then the psalmist would not have spoken later on of another rest, right? a consummate rest, a spiritual rest, a heavenly rest. The land is not our rest. Joshua is not our king. He was a type and a foreshadow of one to come. The promised land, the land of Canaan, was a type and a foreshadow of our true home, where true rest is. And it was a foreshadow of our true Sabbath, our heavenly Sabbath. And that's why it's important to see how often and why the Lord reflects upon the righteousness or the unrighteousness of Israel's kings. Because that shows you what the reign is like because the relationship to God is established by the king as he leads the people. Now, Roman number two, God leads Israel through the days of Joshua into possession of the land. He defeats the, and destroys the pagan inhabitants. The theological thrust, you can go back to Joshua, the theological thrust of the book of Joshua um, can be grasped by, by reading the first and the last two chapters of the book. Really, in the middle of all of that is all of the details of Joshua bringing them into the land from one battle to the next. And as they begin, the land gets divided and they go in and they take possession of their various lots, at least most of those areas. But the Lord brings them in, He gives them possession. And just as the journey out of Egypt and through the wilderness was marked by the Lord's miraculous presence with Moses, so the journey into the occupation of the land was marked by the Lord's miraculous presence with Joshua. And it begins in chapter 3 of Joshua with the parting of the River Jordan. Right, The Lord stops the river from flowing. They cross over on dry ground. This is significant because that's what happened to the fathers, right? Remember Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 that Israel was baptized into Moses when they went through the Red Sea. The Red Sea was parted. They went through on dry land, a mighty work of Yahweh, that Moses is the Lord's servant. Moses is dead, right? And who is like Moses? Not Joshua. But is the Lord with Joshua? He told Joshua not to be afraid. He would be with them, and he manifests that. And he makes that point in the chapter. He manifests that, and he will cause the people to stand in awe of him like they stood in awe of Moses. And this is very significant, that the Jordan is stopped, and they cross over on dry land, and they come in, of course, to Jericho for that initial battle. The Lord is with Joshua. But notice now, you remember the story. I'm not going to read it, but Joshua is commanded to take 12 stones out of the riverbed and to set up as a memorial in the place where they first camped in the Promised Land. And we're told that this memorial will be a perpetual occasion for the children of Israel to ask, why? And what have you know, why this memorial? What's it, you know, decades later, centuries later, what's this memorial, right? In time to come, the Lord talks about it in chapter 4, in verse 6, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Verse 7 of chapter 4, Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Notice the focus on the ark, right? Not Joshua, not the people, God. Remember what I said? It's God's presence that changes and means everything. It's God who stopped the waters. It's God who led his people through. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And as it goes on, Joshua <clears throat> is told that when the, your children ask, Israel will recount the grace and the covenant of God. And Graham Goldsworthy says this on letter B, Notice how consistently the gospel of the saving acts of God is presented in its Old Testament form as the only way to make sense of Israel exi Israel's existence. Who is Israel? There's no way to make sense of their existence. What is it that makes Israel so special, so different from all the other nations? Yahweh, Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, the promise of God. It's Yahweh that has distinguished his people. It's Yahweh who went into Egypt to bring them out. It's Yahweh who rescued them. It's Yahweh who brought them through the wilderness, who gave them victory over the Amorite kings, and who now, through Joshua, brings them across the Jordan into the land and will bring them victoriously throughout the land. The Lord, of course, you know, destroys Jericho. 
And this illustrates the outworking of his covenant promise to bring them into the land by a mighty hand. But it's not without human involvement. This is also significant, right? They're to march around the city, right? Seven times, and on the seventh day, seven times. And they're to march around, and they're to bring, the Lord is going to bring the walls completely down, miraculously. But the people must obey. If the people did not obey in doing what the Lord had said, then the walls would not come down, right? So the Lord is pleased to involve human response. The Lord is pleased to condition, if you will, His fulfillment upon their obedience. If they obey, they shall see the might of God. They shall see the victory of God. And of course they do, and there is victory. But it shows this important connection that God's redemptive acts, His saving of His people, even through Moses, bringing them out of Egypt and through the wilderness, right? The Lord's redemptive actions are often mediated through chosen people. Most particularly what happens What we see throughout Israel's history is God's saving actions are mediated through prophets, priests, and kings. As we said this morning, right? How does Christ execute the office of prophet, priest, and king? How does he execute the office of mediator? He does it as prophet, priest, and king in his humiliation and exaltation. So you can see how the way is being prepared in Israel's history for Christ. And you can see how, we might say in one respect, you can see how it takes three offices Right? To make up and to, to, to show and to grasp something of who this man is that's coming. Who is this king that is also a prophet and also a priest? Who is the one that will be worthy to lead God's people in? Who is the one that will be able to give God's people rest? As mighty as Moses, as mighty as Joshua, as mighty as Aaron, and yet as Hebrews says, better, better, and better, and better still. Because it's the Son of God, the God-man. Turn to Joshua 7. I'm just trying to highlight a few things here. Joshua 7, we read about the sin of Achan. The sin of Achan is important for several reasons, but for one, it's instructive because it highlights the biblical principle of corporateness and representation. This is important because the sin of Achan shows us how God works, how God thinks of people, how God thinks of relationships. So we're not going to take the time to read the entire account, but you realize that they, are, they go into battle Ai, which should have been easy after the fall of Jericho, and yet they're defeated. Joshua cries out, Why, O Lord, why are we struck down before them? Look at verse 7. Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan, on the other side, right? Where we had already destroyed the two Amorite kings. We were already living in their land. We should have just stayed there. O oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? But the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut us off, cut off our name from the earth. And, love what he says, what will this do? What will you do? Excuse me. What will you do for your great name? I think Joshua is defending himself, right? Reminds us of what David said earlier about Psalm 137, right? What about our name, our reputation? In the end, Joshua is not concerned about the Israelites because what is it that makes the Israelites the Israelites? Yahweh. Who are the Israelites above anybody else? Yahweh. Yahweh distinguishes them. It's your great name that is upon us, right? Think of the ironic blessing. You have put your name upon us. What happens to us reflects upon you. Your Ark is with us, your presence is with us, your covenant has been made with us. What will you do for your great name? Lord of course, go, the Lord, of course, goes on to describe the sin of Achan. Now, several things are shown here. What we see is Achan, of course, is guilty. But who gets punished? His whole household, right? his whole family. In the morning, verse 14, they're brought before the Lord by tribes, Brought by the lots or casts are brought by clans, clans by houses, man by man. He who is taken with the devoted thing shall be burned with fire, and he that all that he and all that he has, verse fifteen. Then Joshua said, verse nineteen, to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, God of Israel, and give praise to him. Isn't that interesting? Confessing your sins gives glory to God and praise to him. Give glory to the Lord, give him praise. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered, Truly I have sinned. This is what I did. And I sinned against the Lord God of Israel. Psalm 51. Against you only have I sinned. 
When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, I coveted them, I took them, and they're hidden inside my tent. So you see what happens, right? Verse 25, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. And then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. And so Achan, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. Let's look at the top of page two here. When Achan is revealed as the offender, his entire household is destroyed. Right? His entire household. Back up a little further. When Achan, as an Israelite, was the offender, all of Israel is punished. The entire army can't move against the, against the people of Ai, and they're defeated. Judgment, right? The, the army, the people of Israel are affected by Achan's sin. And then as Achan is singled out, his entire household is destroyed. This shows that the one represents the many because there's a corporate solidarity in the mind of God. There's, what I'm trying to say here is God is dealing with Israel with these perspectives of corporate solidarity, oneness, unity, right? And we see this throughout Scripture. We know from Romans, Genesis 3 with the fall itself, but also what Paul says in Romans 5, the entire human race fell in Adam, right? God dealt with the entire human race through Adam. He dealt with the entire family of Achan through Achan. And in the battle, he dealt with all of Israel through Achan, right, in that regard. So the entire human race is represented before God in Adam. The entire elect is represented before God in Christ. Go back to Genesis 6, right? Who found favor in God's eyes? Noah. Who was saved? Noah's household, right? Genesis 12, 15, 17, in Abraham, right? God chooses Abraham. But in Abraham... And through Abraham, he chooses an entire nation, Abraham's descendants, which at that point, of course, Abram had none. Right? His wife was barren. But through in Abraham, by choosing Abraham, he chooses his descendants. And that's why the Lord goes into Egypt, because they're Abraham's descendants. Through the ministry of one priest, all of Israel is reconciled, reconciled to God. One priest makes an offering. One priest represents the people through the sacrifice that he brings. And one priest then comes out and blesses the entire people. So beginning in Genesis and interwoven throughout Israel's existence, Israel's worship, Israel's way of life, you have these two ideas of representation and substitution. These themes are continuing to be repeated, right? These, these notes are continuing to be sounded. It's about representation. It's about substitution. These are being fixed in the, in the mind of Israel, right? This is why it's so significant as Peter preaches his Pentecost sermon and he says unto the Jews, right, what shall we do to be saved, right? Repent and be baptized, right, all of you. Repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall be saved, right, because the promise of God is for you and your children, right? God has always worked with representation, always worked with families. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so these notions are being fixed because remember, upon the history of Israel is being typed out the history of redemption, so that means themes and concepts are going to be unfolded in the history. We're listening, we're hearing about the theme of a leader and a king and what kind of king God is raising up for his people. A man, a human king, but a holy king, a righteous king, a prophetic king, a priestly king, an atoning king. This is the kind of man that God has for his people. And it takes all these men along the way to foreshadow bit by bit another aspect and another beautiful side of Christ who is to come. Next we meet Rahab, of course, as the story unfolds. They come into Jericho, you meet Rahab and her family. What's interesting about Rahab is they enter Israel by faith. You remember Rahab speaks of the fear of everyone because Yahweh, the Lord your God, we know he is giving you the land. So Rahab is shown to be a person of faith and she trusts she hears, the, she hears the reports, she believes the reports, and when the spies come, she protects the spies. And of course, they promise to save her. And she is shown to be one of faith, and she is brought into Israel. Now, as we think about what the Lord had said to Israel so many times through, jo through Moses, right? When they come into the land, they're prevented from intermarrying with the Canaanites, right? 
right? Don't serve their gods. Don't take their daughters, right? As wives for your sons. Don't give your daughters as wives for their sons. Don't intermarry. You are my people separated unto the Lord. And yet, inherent within the very promise of God to Abraham in Genesis 12 is what? Through your seed, all the nations will be blessed. So there seemed to be a contradiction here, right? You're not allowed to intermarry or have any minglings with the nations. But I'm bringing blessing to you and through you that will be for the nations. So it's interesting as we see that played out in Israel's history, and we see it when someone like Rahab and her family is brought in. Gentiles, and yet brought in. But notice they're brought in by faith, right? God can bring anyone in as he pleases, but you're not allowed to go out and intermingle. In other words, God has a plan for the nations, and that nation, that plan will not include you compromising or intermingling with the world. So the thing to understand is that while Israel was forbidden to mix with the nations, yet foreigners, strangers, and outcasts, and sojourners were permitted to enter Israel. They were, they were permitted as proselytes to come into Israel. This highlights a couple of things. Right in the middle of your page, letter C, it's designed to teach us two things. First of all, that there is no other way revealed for salvation, for exiled humanity. In order for humanity to be saved, in order for any human being, any son of Adam to be saved, he had to become what? An Israelite. He had to become a convert, right, to the faith of Yahweh. He had to abandon his idols, abandon the hope of self-righteousness and saving himself, and he had to come into Israel as a proselyte. He had to convert to the faith of the nation of Israel because Israel was the one nation to whom God had revealed his saving grace. And this is what we see with Ruth. How does Ruth, the Moabite, come into Israel? By faith. Anybody can come in. There's all this talk of sojourners. Remember when Abraham was told to, to circumcise his son Ishmael? We're, to, we were, we're told that he circumcised himself, his son Ishmael, and all the servants in his house. Right? Servants, no doubt, from other nations. But at the same time, what happened? They're being brought into the faith of Yahweh. There's a way open for any to come. But the Old Testament message is clear. As Paul says in Romans 9, to Israel was given the oracles, the promises, the covenant, and eventually the Christ. The gospel is for all, but it's only given in one measure, and that is through the faith and through the testimony and the revelation given to Israel, and ultimately, of course, the New Testament unto the disciples to spread that message forth. So it shows that there's no other way, no other revealed way of salvation, but the way God had revealed to Israel. Secondly, it foreshadows people like Rahab and, of course, Ruth. It foreshadows the extension of God's grace to the Gentiles. And when does that happen? After the accomplishment of salvation. Remember what Jesus said in, during his, his, his ministry in Matthew 10, right? Don't go unto any of the Samaritans. Don't go unto any of the Gentiles. I'm sending you out two by two to go to the house of Israel. Why? Because to them belongs the kingdom. Right? The message is to them first. Tell them their Messiah is here. Tell them the kingdom, the promised kingdom is at hand. Repent. The message was to them first. But remember what Paul does in <clears throat> Acts 13 when he gets rejected and then later stoned in Acts 14. Right? He wipes the dust off of his feet. Right? He says, I was told to come to you first. But if you're rejecting me, I'm going to the Gentiles. And he does. And the Gentiles rejoice. And we're told in Acts 13, 48, that all who were ordained to eternal life believe. The Gentiles rejoiced because the gospel came to them. What gospel was it? The gospel of Abraham. The gospel of the covenant given to Abraham through David and consummated and fulfilled ultimately in Christ. When we think of the book of Judges, we're not going to spend any time there. You know the book of Judges. You have this cycle, Right? Goldsworthy says, if the book of Joshua highlights the successful possession of the land, the book of Judges concentrates on the blemishes that accompany it, as the people do not drive out all the Canaanites. And they become thorns in their side, they become snares to them. In fact, you read in Joshua, excuse me, Judges chapter 1, the people bring them in and make them servants, right? In essence, they make covenants with them. We will not destroy you if you'll be cutters of wood and drawers of water, right? You can serve us, right? The failure to complete the conquest in Judges chapter 1. This sets the stage for what the book of Judges is about, right? Look at Judges chapter 2. This is really all we need to read of Judges. 
Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now what's interesting is, if we go back, we're not going to read chapter 1, but you look beginning at verse 27 of chapter 1, and they did not drive them out, and they did not drive them out, and they did not drive them out, and they did not drive them out. See what the people are doing? They're not driving them out. But notice what the Lord says in verse 3. I will not drive them out. Right? You see, it's two sides of the same coin. The Lord's redemptive actions, right, are, being, are to be carried out by human mediators. And the Lord's redemptive actions, His giving the people the land, are to be joined with their obedience to the Lord, right? Believe me that this is your land. Believe me that the gods of the nations will be a snare to you. Believe me that they are, that they are to be uh, dispossessed. They are to be driven out. And in the case of the banned nations, they are to be killed. They will not. They will not be a help to you. They will be a snare to you. But well, the people don't believe, and because of their unbelief, their laziness, they don't drive the people out. And so the Lord says, I will not drive them out. You can see the interplay between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. God will drive them out as you drive them out. If you fail to drive them out, the Lord will not drive them out for you. The Lord calls for his people to believe and obey. And so the theme of the book is set out in those verses once the people have the land, there's this pattern, this vicious cycle, right, as the Lord gives them up to their enemies. Final thing I want to end on tonight, look at Roman numeral 5. What we learn from, what we learn through Judges and then into the Samuels and the Kings is the people dwell in the land physically. They're in the land. It would seem that all is well. You have the people of God, right, in the place of God, and it would appear with the presence of God, of course. They have the ark, they have the representative king, etc. But although the people dwell physically in the land, their disobedience, as we just read from Judges, their disobedience prevents them from enjoying the blessings of being God's people with God's presence in God's place. If you're going to disobey me and you're not going to destroy their idols and you're not going to drive them out, then you're not going to enjoy the blessings that I have in store for you. Because God's blessings can't be merited by obedience, but God's blessings are tied to obedience because obedience is the fruit of faith, right? We obey a God whom we love and believe, whose word we believe and we stand in awe of him and worship him. So obedience is tied to faith, and therefore God's blessings and the enjoyment of them is tied to obedience. If we won't obey, God's not going to obey for you. God's not going to just do it for you. He's going to call you to be a people of courage and obedience and faith. And if we don't, then we forfeit the enjoyment of being the people of God in the place of God with the presence of God. So this teaches us then, the letter A, that fellowship with God is not by birth or nationality. Fellowship with God is by faith. This is what he said to Joshua. Meditate on my word. Believe my word. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Right? Fellowship with God is by faith. And although the enjoyment of God's blessings cannot be merited, they can only be enjoyed by obedience, which is the fruit of true faith. Remember the, what we talked about in Sunday school this morning, a good work arising from a, the right heart. That's how we enjoy God's blessings. And so Roman number 6, because of their sinful rejection of the Lord, Israel repeatedly enters into a kind of captivity. And that's what's so strange and troubling as we read the history of Israel, and then we begin to read the prophets with it, it's like they're in the land, they're no longer captives in a foreign land, but in the land they enter into this kind of captivity, signaled by this cycle in Judges itself, but also by all of the oppression and wars that they face even when kings are over them in the land. This teaches us that what makes Canaan special, what makes Israel special, is God's presence. Right? Israel is in the land as Abraham's descendants. But it takes more than that. Because of their sin, 
they repeatedly experience a form of exile as God withdraws. And he says, hey, I'm not going to drive them out of your land. They will be snares to you. Their gods will be a snare to you, right? The Lord will not drive them out. And so God withdraws and they're in the land and they begin to experience a kind of exile in the land itself. He permits them to eat the fruit of their deeds. He permits them to be oppressed by enemies. So what becomes clear is what Moses said in Exodus 33. If you will not go with us, do not take us up from here. What becomes clear is that without God's presence, nothing else matters. Being Abraham's descendants doesn't matter if we don't have God's presence. Being in the land of Canaan doesn't matter if we don't have God's presence. It's God that makes Canaan what it is. It's God that makes Israelites what they are. Salvation, peace, rest, blessedness, they all boil down. Right? They all boil down not to being the right, the right people or in the right place. They boil down to being with God. They boil down to fellowship with God. Remember what John says in 1 John, we write these things unto you that you may have fellowship with God, that your joy may be full. Think of Asaph in Psalm 73, right? There is nothing on earth I desire beside you. Psalm 80, shine upon us that we may be saved. Psalm 144, 15, blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Right? It's God's presence that makes it what it is. Again, the heart of the covenant, Leviticus 26, 12. I will be with you, and I will walk among you as my God, and you'll be my people. That's the heart of the covenant. That's what makes any place special. God is there. That may, that's what makes any people special. God is there. Without God, it doesn't matter who we are or where we live, right? It's God that changes everything. So we've got this, these three things brought together, right? People, place, and presence. But it's God's presence that bring these three together and make them what they are. So the struggle as we continue, we're going to look at the kings next time as we uh, take up the rest of the story here of Israel in the land. But the struggle that we're going to see continually is the people continuing to disobey. And because they disobey, they forfeit the enjoyment of the blessings. And ultimately, what do they forfeit? The land. And then ultimately, what do they forfeit? To lose the presence of God, that's where it begins. And then to lose the land, that's next. But there's one thing left. To lose being the people, which is what happens to the ten tribes, which is what happens to Israel, right? They're still in exile, right? They're never returned. They're dispersed by the Assyrians, and they're in this perpetual exile, outcast, which is exactly what the Lord threatened. I'll cast you out, right? And how did, they, how did it get that far? What was their first act? Their rejection of Yahweh, apostasy. To your tents, O Israel, we have no inheritance in David, right? Matthew Henry always said, God, God never forsakes anybody but those who first forsake him. So you have this long history of the ten tribes, Israel, and it begins in an act of apostasy, not him, but Barabbas. And it ends in perpetual, enduring exile, right? It's terrifying, but it shows that we cannot live without the presence of God. But if we have the presence of God, then we could be in the wilderness and we'd still be okay. We could be in Egypt and we'd still be okay, right? We, we don't need the land and we don't need a nomenclature because if we have the presence of God, then we have the, the name of God upon us. That's our nomenclature. Not that we're Israelites, but, but that we're God's people, right? With the name of the Lord upon us. And if we have the presence of God, then the land is where God is. Right? But again, all of these things are being used throughout in Israel's history to point to what only one person can bring about and what is more glorious than an Israelite king, more glorious than an Israelite temple, more glorious than an Israelite land. Heaven, the presence of God, the new Jerusalem, and all that God has in store for us. But it takes all of this history and all of these types and shadows to try to get at something of what God has in store for us in Christ which is far more than we could ask or imagine. All right, amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we stand in awe tonight of your grace. We stand in awe that you are such a one that has come to redeem such a people as we are. If we reflect just for a moment on the great distance 
that exists between the creator and the creature. Lord, it is far greater than we can even understand or comprehend. But it doesn't even begin to compare with the great distance between the one who is holy and we who are unholy. And yet, Lord, you have bridged this gap. Even in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have bridged this gap in the gospel. And it has pleased you to come down to man, indeed, to become a man in your Son, that you may save a people. We know that we are not better than any. It is by the grace of God that we have been distinguished from others. It is by the grace of God that we have been saved from Adam. And we thank you for the refuge we have found in Christ. Thank you for the new life you have given to us. We thank you for the history of Israel. And as we continue to study it, we pray that you would grant to us uh, increasing understanding of the glory of the gospel. And may we come to understand better and better, typed out through Israel's history, just the unfolding of redemption, the great and the grand plan of God, the covenant of grace. Thank you, Lord, for the, the beauty of continuity as we see these gospel veins traced through Israel's history. And we see the, the beginnings and the working out, Lord, of what we so enjoy as being consummated and finished in Christ. We thank you that we are on the other side of the cross. We are on the other side of it having been finished and done. And we long for the day when this Messiah, this prophet, priest, and king, this ruler of Israel, the Israel of God, would come and take us home and that we might indeed be in the very presence of God forever and ever. Oh Lord, this is our heart. This is that for which we long. We long for your presence. We pray with the church, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Hasten the day, O God, when Christ shall come for his church, when we shall see him as he is and become like him. And until then, O Lord, uh, let us have this hope, this hope for his return. And by this hope, may we purify ourselves even as he is pure. Sanctify us, O God, we pray, and bless us. Take us, we ask, into this week of work and labor and whatever may occupy us this week. We pray that we might be faithful. We pray that we might live as the people of God. Grant to us, O Lord, the fruition of the work of your Spirit, that we may bear fruit, as we heard in Sunday school this morning, that we may live out our faith, that the gospel, having impacted and changed our hearts, may also change our lives, and that it may impact, Lord, our not just our creed, but our will and how we conduct ourselves. Pray that we would live as a baptized, holy people this week as we go forth. Make us witnesses to the good things of God, the good news of the gospel. Let us not be ashamed of Christ, but be bold. We pray that we may see you at work in our families, particularly working in the lives of our loved ones, our children, our parents, our spouses, all those whom we love may, that, that may not know the Lord today. Lord, may that be changed by your grace. And we thank you for what you're doing in this church and congregation. Continue to build us up, bind our hearts together, strengthen our love one for another. May you continue to bless this church and make us a blessing in this community, especially through these summer months. It's so encouraging to see so many visitors each week, Lord, in this season. Lord, bless them as they come. Send them away with our warmth and our love and with the gospel. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.